What's up YouTube? Ian Sandusky back here again for Let's Machine. Today we're going to go through some beginner stuff on types of fixturing, types of work holding, and some of the best times to use them. Um, I know especially when you're first getting in the trade, it's a little intimidating sometimes to try to figure out how to hold stuff. Uh, we're just going to go through a different couple, a couple of different ways on how to hold things, how to fixture things, and when you know it's time to make a fixture versus using soft jaws versus time to make some hard jaws, etc. Okay, let's go take a look. So first and foremost, vice, regular old vice. This should be your first line of attack on virtually every kind of job that you do because it's the easiest, it's got the easiest ability to be repeatable and accurate, uh, and it's the easiest way to hold things. I can leave vices like this set up in my mills pretty much 24 seven, uh, you know, and a few of them, and I can pretty much always have work to fill them. Obviously you have to have at least two straight sides to each other, two parallel sides. Um, your limits are going to be you know, how much of the part you're holding. If your part's this big and you can only hold this much, uh, that's going to be an issue. Obviously, if you can't open your vise up enough, that's going to be an issue. But this is the easiest way to hold things if you can. Um, you know, I can set a stop up here, put a part in, run it, take the next part in, put it in, run it. They're going to come out the exact same. Um, obviously, you know, if I need to be within microns or something, I'm going to need to use dowel pens or something of the like. But this is the easiest way to do most of your machining tasks. Um, obviously these are straight jaws, so these ones have little steps in them so I can hold something in them. Most of the time you're going to need to use parallels or something so you can make sure your part is flat no matter what it is. But always think of the vise first. If this doesn't work, that's when you move on to other things. First line of attack, vise. So you can see in here, I leave these five G5 double vices set up pretty much 24 seven in my uh, Haas VF5. These are handy because I can take up the center jaw and run big things, or I can run two different things at a time, or because I got five vices in there, I can run long stuff, you know, up to 60 inches. If there's uh, stuff that's gonna flex, I can take out vices and put in more vices closer together, so it's holding on more of it. Uh, this is a pretty typical setup for this machine. I don't think we've had less than four vices in this machine at a time since we've taken the fourth axis off, uh, which was a little bit ago. We've been running long stuff pretty consistently. But this is an easy way to do things. Um, again, like I said, my favorite phrase of the day, apparently, first line of attack. This is it, vices. Now, if you have stuff that needs to be held that's irregularly shaped, our next step is to go to, and personally, in my opinion, is to go to aluminum soft jaws. We run off a bunch of these at a time, typically. Um, they're just standard old aluminum jaws. You know, they kind of look like this with counterbores in them. I guess they would look like that with counterbores in them. And these go in those vices. Now these are used when either I need to mill both ends of things, uh, you know, to do maybe a, a whole part one operation where I have to mill both ends to size, and, you know, it's under six inches. Or, you know, I need to put something in to make sure it's located, or it's irregularly shaped. Um, these are good for holding round things if I don't want to put a chuck in the vise. So for instance, you can see here, you mill these as needed. Um, you can see here that I milled a circle in here, so I would have another, oh, there it is. My other part there, you can see, these held a round part and they got drilled a bunch. Um, typically, I don't know why this isn't on here, I must have forgot, but I'll put the part number on there so I can use these again. These are essentially a type of fixturing, but uh, you know I can always mill that off and put something else in there. Like for instance, you can see here, we had uh, a part with a keyway, so that was a bore and a keyway, so I wanted to make sure that keyway was lined up uh, to, you know, I guess, put a sketch through in or something parallel to the keyway or perpendicular to the keyway. So that's what that's all about. Um, you know, these parts here, I know that they're X shaped. So in order to hold those, we hold those like that, right? It's just different ways of doing things. Um, the negative to these is that they do break down. Um, some of these parts, I don't know if I have any that you can really see clearly, but you can see like in here, some of these parts where they're laser cut or flame cut or whatever, these jaws will break down. Um, if you're doing hundreds of parts regularly, you don't want to use these. These are good for, you know, if I have a jaw come in and I need to do it quickly, I can make step jaws, run it off. If I have a round thing, I can put it in there, hold it, run it off. It's not good for a production run where I'm going to be doing 10,000s of things over a few months. In that case, I want to make steel jaws. So my next line of attack after aluminum jaws are steel jaws. These are hardened jaws that I hard milled. You can see here. They're meant to hold a part, two parts at a time actually, they're shaped like that. Um, so what we did with these parts is 
we milled that side, flipped them, put them in this, in this vise, milled the other side. Um, that locates them so you can make sure you can chamfer them, uh, et cetera. That was because we couldn't just duck off the top material. Long story short, we were trying to save some money. It worked out well. These are really good for parts you're doing lots of. Um, you know, as long as you keep these clean, these things are infinitely repeatable. Um, very little problem getting very accurate results, you know, to within half the hour, a couple tenths out of uh, jaws like these. These jaws have run, these jaws themselves have run, oh, a few thousand parts, seal parts, uh, with absolutely no sign of wear whatsoever. The downside is, these are time consuming to make. Uh, if you're not specializing in hard milling, we are not. You know, it took a long time to mill that out, you know, a couple hours or maybe an hour, I can't really remember, uh, to get to a place where I liked it with a finish I liked, because these are very hard. The good side is, if you're doing a lot of parts, this is a very easy way to do them without setting up for a massive fixture. For these ones here, we had four or five vices set up with this profile, so we ran a lot of them at a time. This was essentially just a, a fixturing that we put in there. If you're doing tens of thousands of parts, you may want to be able to do more than eight at a time. You may want to be able to do 10 to 20 at a time. After that, after this kind of option is exhausted, we move on to actual fixturing. So when I say actual fixturing, I'm referring to things like this behind me inside the Haas VF3. This is a fixture we made up. It's actually a hard anodized aluminum, just because we wanted to be able to make a clamp. Long story short, you can use steel for these. But a large aluminum fixture like this that lets us do 60 parts at a time, 62, 63, I can't remember. Whatever it may be at a time is great for production jobs. We run tens of thousands of these parts a year. This is a good option, you know, aside from, we don't have pallet changers, we could make pallets. Obviously, some of you guys who do this stuff a lot will have different ways of doing this. This is one way of doing it, is to make solid fixtures. These parts come out completely finished. They have the rads done on top, rads on the bottom, completely deburred. They go from here straight to anodizing. It didn't always used to be like this. We used to run these parts five at a time back in the, uh, you know, early 2000s. Uh, I'd have to deburr them by hand and belt sand them when I was a kid back in, actually it must have been the late 90s, I used to run these parts in another unit we had back, uh, I think it could have been in, even in this machine, and it was terrible. You had to, there was so much deburring, your hands would turn to hamburger from all the cuts. So over the years, this is kind of what we came up with. The downside to using fixturing like this is it's obviously large, and it needs to be set up. Setting up the fixturing for this and making sure it's all lined up and, and beautiful and everything is the difficult part. Um, if something gets screwed up in it, it's a lot of money to fix this relative to making a new set of aluminum soft jaws. The upside is, I set this in, I push a button, walk away for three hours, come back, and there's a ton of parts done. Um, it essentially automated this entire operation, this entire job for us. This kind of job isn't worth, I could, I'm not gonna do fixturing like this for a job that I'm doing 500 parts ever for. This is for jobs that you're doing consistently, year in, year out, um, or even you know for a few months at a time. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother going through all the trouble to do it. I would figure out another way to do a few at a time. Um, obviously, you know, when it comes time to make it, you know, when you feel it's worth it to do it, that's something you have to come up with yourself. Um, that's, that, that's analysis, you know, financially, you have to do yourself of what is your time worth? Um, when are you gonna start losing money by fixturing versus holding things in, in vices that way? Lastly, when things are huge, this is the sitting episode, if you couldn't tell, uh, I have to sit, keep being in view of the camera here. But lastly, if it's too big to hold in the vise, and it's too big to use, you know, Mighty Bite clamps on, or fixturing plate that way, or fixturing plate's one way to do it. But one of my last options is T-nuts and clamping assemblies like this. Um, you can obviously, you know, all your tables, no matter what kind of Haas machine, or Haas machine, CNC machine you have, it's gonna have T-slots uh, for T-nuts like these. This is my last option to hold things down. Um, every time I put a part in, I have to indicate it flat, indicate it straight, make sure it's lined up. I need to pick it up every time. There's very little repeatability. Um, it's a very firm way of holding things, like big plates. If you put your clamps on, you can move your clamps around. You know, It's time consuming, and there's a large margin for error if you're not experienced with a lot of the old manual machinist guys and die setters and stuff. These things, they can make them sing. Uh, they can make a setup you couldn't believe with stuff like this. 
you guys in my generation who haven't done as much manual machining and have uh, relied more on, you know, kind of fixturing and stuff and CNC that way, we're probably not as good with these. Um, some of you guys will be. Obviously, I'm not speaking for everybody. I'm just speaking from my own experience. These are my last resort, no matter what. I don't like using these if I don't have to. I hit clamps all the time. Um, you know, I don't typically have things slip, but there's the potential for it there. It's a very firm way of holding things, but this is kind of my last bastion before, you know, I have to look at reevaluating if I can even do this job effectively. Um, the good times to use these are big plates. I'm holding down fixturing plates, so if I make a fixturing plate where I can screw parts down into it, I can always use this to hold it down. That being said, I'd much rather just bolt it straight into the table that way. Um, I don't know if I have any examples. I know I don't have any set up right now, but I'll, uh, I'll take a look upstairs when I go to edit this to see if I have any uh, pictures of setups like this, and if so, I will insert them here. And now that we're back, I don't know if there was anything there, but these are kind of your last attack that way. Uh, always try to start yourself at the vise and work yourself up that way. Um, a lot of this stuff is kind of, in, it sounds, it might be intimidating if you're just kind of getting into CNC machining, but a lot of it's very intuitive. Um, you're not gonna use a vise to hold enormous stuff because you won't be able to hold enormous stuff in a vise, plain and simple. You learn pretty quick, if you're holding something this far in a vise, it's this big, and you're fly cutting it, that it's gonna kink. Um, you know, you're gonna screw up a couple times until you start to figure out what's a good way to hold things. Um, you can turn vices on their sides to hold things sideways. Um, obviously, when you get more into things, you need to get into fourth axis fixturing, you need to get into fifth axis fixturing, which I have zero experience in. But, um, you know, don't be intimidated by it. Try a couple different setups with things, try making fixturing for things, and obviously ask the more experienced guys at your shop what their opinion on it is, okay? Thank you very much for hanging out with me, guys. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. If you want to see more videos, make sure you like and subscribe below. You take care.